our 1000th episode is coming out in June. And I know you want to send me a present. You probably want to Venmo me some money or do something, but you don't have to do that. The best present you could give me is to go do a review. We are trying to get a thousand reviews of the podcast by the thousandth episode. If there's an episode that stands out to you, something that's impacted you, and you've never done a review for Practice of the Practice, head on over to your favorite place that you listen to the podcast and do a review. We are trying to get a thousand reviews by our thousandth episode. We'd love for you to go leave us a review for the Practice of the Practice podcast. This is the Practice of the Practice podcast with Joe Sanox, session number 995. I'm Joe Sanok, your host, and welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. We have been doing this series throughout most of May on psychedelic-assisted therapies. We've covered MDMA, we've covered ibogaine, we've covered uh, psilocybin, we've talked about ayahuasca, all sorts of really interesting things. Um, one thing we haven't covered is some of the kind of politics and some of the trainings and things like that, so I'm really excited to dig in with our guests today to talk about some of that, but before we dive into the show... On June 5th, in just a couple episodes here, we are hitting episode 1000. Now, I know a bunch of you have um, sent in voicemails for that episode. Our goal is to hit 1,000 reviews by June 5th. Uh, we, at the time of this recording, are about a third of the way there, I'm sure, because we've been promoting this kind of throughout this month lead up. Um, if you've liked this show, uh, we don't very often ask for reviews or ratings or subscriptions, but it really helps boost kind of our overall ranking, our overall visibility. And it'd be just like a nice little gift for you to give back to us for our thousandth episode. So if you want to give back by doing a review of, you know, what was one of your favorite episodes? You know, what were some of the things you liked? We just, you know, before this series, we interviewed some Harvard Business Review authors. Um, you know, we've got coming up some holistic therapy practice. Uh, Sarah Baker is going to be talking with us. Us. Um, we have another person in a couple episodes talking about federal contracts. So we're covering a lot of stuff. And if you want to do a review, that would be such a great gift for our 1000th episode. So let's see if we can get to a thousand reviews by the thousandth episode. Well, I am so excited to have Justin Townsend, who is the CEO and head facilitator at Myco Meditations. Uh, Justin brings extensive experience as an advisor to startups, particularly in healthcare, along with a unique blend of business acumen and keen interest in futuristic health models. Throughout his career, he's worked as a business leader across various industries, aiding innovative companies in identifying opportunities, communicating their vision, and delivering profitable products. Products. I am so excited to have him here today because in a private retreat with Myco Meditations in 2017, he realized the potential to merge his business expertise with his passion for alternative healing, leading him to join the team and become a partner in 2019. As a retreat facilitator, he is inspired by the profound healing he observes and is a strong advocate for the potential of psychedelics in mental health. Justin, welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. Thank you, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, take me back to 2017. So you do a, a private retreat and that stirs something in you. Actually, I was stirred prior to that. <laughs> take um, us back farther so, then. Okay. So I had a deep, deep interest in psychology, the, the collective human condition as well as the individual condition, beginning with my own. Uh, that led to a meditation practice and then... Um, in the year 2000, I had my very first ayahuasca ceremony. Um, that was in the UK. Uh, that was part of the, that was an underground ceremony that I had. And I then began my relationship with ayahuasca and really working to help facilitate ceremonies um, as part of the European underground uh, psychedelic movement, working with lots of great medicine men, medicine women, and as well as some clinicians as well. And then over the years, I developed a breathwork uh, practice and kept my hand in leading breathwork retreats. And then in 2017, as you mentioned, I had a private retreat um, in Jamaica, and the rest is history. And now we have Micah Meditations. We're a Western contemporary therapeutic model uh, doing psilocybin-assisted therapy uh, here in Jamaica. Mm. Now, one thing before we started recording, um, 
the you know I'd asked you before. I always like to talk about the episode before we start recording. Uh, was you know what's something you're excited about, you're thinking about, um, and one was talking about psychedelics in the U.S. and Europe, and how Colorado and Oregon have kind of changed some of the ways that they view it. First, give us an overview of kind of what's going on, and then we'd love to dig into kind of some of the the more nuanced parts of that topic. Okay, so on a federal level, MDMA is looking like it's going to be rescheduled at some point this year. Um, Initially, that would be a limited use type rollout just for chronic or treatment resistant PTSD. But undoubtedly, as more research is done, it will expand beyond that limited use model. Um, The same thing apparently is going to happen with psilocybin in the next two to three years. Um, again, again, beginning with limited use, likely for depression first, then expanding out to cover anxiety and, and all manner of other uh, mental health conditions. The great thing about psilocybin is that Roland Griffiths, of uh, God rest his soul now, he's died. One of the luminaries at uh, Johns Hopkins said that psilocybin has transdiagnostic advocacy. And certainly here on retreat, whether it's childhood trauma, depression, anxiety, end of life anxiety, alcohol use disorder, fibromyalgia, cluster headaches, um, we very successfully treat all manner of um, seemingly intractable and acute mental health conditions with psilocybin. And so what's happened is that, is that until the feds uh, reschedule, um, states such as Oregon and soon enough Colorado are developing their own set of rules and regulations, both for treatment centers and uh, license facilitation in the states of Oregon and Colorado. Um, I am happy that clients with mental health conditions that will be helped with psychedelics will have access to this medicine, be it on a federal level, maybe once it's been in, in, uh, maybe like uh, integrated into existing medical and healthcare infrastructure, but also for the opportunity for therapists and psychologists and others to practice on a state level as well. With that said, my only reservations are is that the training and education, and especially the experiential component, is just woefully inadequate. There's, you know, unless if you're a if you're perhaps a psychiatric nurse or a therapist or a psychologist that's worked on an ER ward and you're used to seeing people that may be in a state of psychosis or mania, or they've come off of their um, their bipolar medication and they're uh, dysregulated and disordered, um, nothing really in existing therapeutic training leads you to be ready to work with people in the dosing space. And so one thing that we realized, and we've been around for about 10 years, is that many people are basically walking trauma units and they either don't realize it themselves or they've not been diagnosed. And so when they take some psilocybin, they're going to process a lot of this trauma. And as I'm sure many of your listeners will know that the need to be highly trauma informed and experienced will be essential to this work as well. And I just don't think there's enough of the, the enough of the experiential training within these current training programs. Mm. Now, when you think about Oregon, Colorado, other places, I know one leading issue is the idea of access. And, and so even talking with Jonathan earlier in this series, you know, he did a, a private webinar for us um, with some therapists, and he was talking about how with a lot of it, MDMA assisted therapy looks like it may cost, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. Um mm-hmm. and, you know, that idea of access and especially minority communities or, you know, mm-hmm. just all sorts of things. How do you think through that? Because before we started recording, you were talking about how in some states they're taking kind of shortcuts to keep the training cheaper, but then they're also not getting things. Can you kind of dig into the whole training and access side of this? Sure. So whilst I think that affordability, accessibility, and inclusivity for those that want to work in this space um, is a very noble cause, and it's absolutely justified. Um, unfortunately, the cost of these trainings that often take place over numerous months, lots of classroom work, role playing, education, um, that they're, they're actually quite expensive. And then um, when it comes to the experiential piece, normally there's like 40 to 60 hours or basically they're, they're requiring that you have five to six client sessions totaling about 40 to 60 hours before you then become licensed as a psychedelic uh practitioner in either either Oregon or Colorado. And that to me is woefully inadequate. It's woefully inadequate. So 
Um, whether this has to be supplemented via subsidies from the federal level or the state level to actually give people the training and experiential um, expertise that they need, I don't know if that's a solution, but I just find 30 to 40 hours is woefully inadequate. And at the end of the day, with such a focus being on the affordability and accessibility and cheapening the cost of training and shortening the amount of hours, at the end of the day, it's the clients and the patients that will be, uh, unfortunately, paying for that by being um, not well supervised during their sessions. Now, those 30 to 40 hours, are those kind of direct observation facilitation hours or are those, you know, like learning hours? Those are direct observational and facilitation hours. But with that said, you never know how anybody is going to respond to psilocybin. And if the average therapist is used to having a client come to their office and sit and talk calmly with them for an hour or two, that's not at all representative of how things happen down here. You're going to be, I mean, we actually do group work down here, and I can speak to that as it speaks to the scale of economies for psychedelic work. Um, we, we cap off at 12 guests. Our, we do three dosing days throughout the week. All of our clients are very spread out. And we have a ratio of about, um, on, on a retreat of about 12 people, we'd have eight or nine facilitators, the vast majority of which are very, very experienced in psychedelic work. And um, they're going to spend six to seven to eight hours with, with each client uh, as that happens. And, you know, you can have people that will put the mask on and the headphones on and take a dose of psilocybin and have a very calm experience. But about 25 to 30 percent are going to have challenging experiences. And by challenging, I don't mean a bad trip. I mean that maybe there was a trauma that happened 20 or 30 years ago. Maybe they're aware that that trauma happened. Maybe they are unaware the trauma happened because disassociative amnesia has been so effective. And they're going to start to recall fragments of memory of these traumas. And at the same time, their body is going to start to process the physiological and emotional responses to that trauma as well. And that can sometimes get a bit active and violent. And so we train all the time on how to constrain and restrain people safely. Um, but it's just not very typical that people will lay down and, and be quiet uh, with, with their masks and headphones on and just lay there flat for six hours. And all you have to do is be present just in case. It's a lot more active than that. What, do you, what are your thoughts on, you know, one thing that I've heard about is not being a facilitator, but being just a sitter for someone to just be that safe person. Like, what are your thoughts on people sitting compared to having people that are professionally trained? I would say that first of all, um, even when a guest has their eye mask on and headphones on, their emotional antenna are very extended when they're taking a therapeutic dose of psilocybin. And if the sitter observes the person starting to unravel or to become agitated and they start to act out, if that facilitator is not confident and experienced, um, they may not be able to, to emotionally regulate themselves very well, it's very likely that the client that they're working with won't feel safe and will pick up on that unease and that anxiety, and that can spin the client out as well. Um, and if you're not trauma-informed and you're not used to working with people that have been through trauma, saying the wrong thing, using the wrong tone, um, can lead to a lot of more complications and, and the risk of, of, of uh, re-traumatization as well. As an aside, um, ethics is a very, very big piece of any licensed clinician's uh, education and training. And ethics is certainly a part of the ongoing psychedelic training. But, you know, what you're going to see with many clients, especially those with, say, early childhood sexual abuse, they're going to become disinhibited very quickly. They can be very suggestible. There can be the release of strong and powerful libidinous energies or sexual energies. There can be a, an abundance of erotic transference and projection. So that's one side of what you're dealing with. On the other hand, um, the psychedelic facilitation space is attracting people um, that maybe are composed of some of the more dark triad type traits, be they subclinical or clinical. They're drawn to this work like moths to a lamp. And... Uh, quite a bit of grandiosity as well. And they can very quickly find themselves um, in romantic interludes with their clients. And that, and we're hearing about that happening in South America and we're hearing about it happening all over the U S as well. Mm. 
Yeah, I think in one podcast I've I've referenced throughout that um, a friend of mine suggested was uh, Cover Story did a really solid um, podcast series about that side of it, of just these these things that have happened, kind of the dark side of a lot of the psychedelic work. Now, mm-hmm. from a protection standpoint, um, and I know that this isn't you know a full training here, but you know what are some of the basics of you know people that are facilitators like what. What kind of trainings should they have? What kind of basic protections? What kind of best practices? And I know that we we don't yet have like a code of ethics, for example. Like, but what are things if you were part of a board that was kind of creating best practices um, around these things? What would you want to see? I think background checks on individuals is is absolutely key. Is, is the very first thing. Make sure there's no criminal record. Um, or any of the prior accusations as part of their history, whether that's through a licensing body or a police check. Um, the kind of things I'd like to see, I mean, it's extensive. A lot of these existing training courses are very good at talking about the basics of what you need to understand, um, contraindications from different medications, the ethics piece and so on. But And, and you can certainly watch how people um, role play. I mean, all of the original MDMA training was Role watching people role play this, but at the end of the day, anybody can captain a ship in calm weather. But can you captain a ship in a hurricane? And no amount of watching and doing role playing is going to prepare you for when a client on a therapeutic dose is unraveling, coming apart at the scenes, is flailing around, wants to run, wants to leave, is projecting, is thrashing around. Um, maybe there's a tendency towards self harm. Um, being around that continuously with experienced team members is key. And so that's why I'm a big advocate of a, of a much longer supervised, um, extensive amount of experiential training, because there's, you know, we see such a wide variety. We've had people here that have survived plane crashes, people that have um, had attempted murders, people that have been kidnapped, people that have, have, have witnessed uh, attempted murders on them and their family members, all the way through to um, people that have depression and anxiety through a series of ongoing different um, adverse life effects. And like I say, you just never know how people are going to respond to psilocybin and you cannot afford to be a deer in the headlights. You, you know, you will find in your clinician's office back in the US that if you're working with a difficult client um, and maybe they're getting a bit agitated, you can mask that on your face that you're maybe feeling a, you know, slightly in turmoil within or a bit anxious about this interreaction, this, this reaction that you're observing. But in the dosing space, no matter how well you try and mask your reaction to what the guest is doing, they're going to tap into your emotions and feel that you're not that, that you're feeling insecure or, or anxious. And so that's going to send them spinning out. So I'm a big proponent really of more and more and more experiential training. The classroom education pieces are fine. They give you the basics of what you need to know. But being around clients consistently um, that will go through a powerful catharsis learning to regulate around that, learning when to speak, when not to speak, um, and how how to work well with other practitioners that are also working with that person in a non-verbal fashion is also key as well. Imagine the impact you could have with your clients when you are able to practice the most cutting edge modality available today. Psychedelic therapy is the future of mental health care and the Integrative Psychiatry Institute will empower you with the tools and knowledge you need to master this exciting modality. IPI's comprehensive training and in-person experiential practicums will elevate you both personally and professionally. This in-depth curriculum is the gold standard certification in the field. When you join, you will step into a global community of thousands of innovative colleagues who are integrating psychedelic therapy into their practices. Visit psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply, where you will find all the information you need about IPI's training. And when you visit psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply, you will also receive IPI's free e-report on the current state of psychedelic therapy so you can get the most up-to-date information immediately. Again, that's psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply to learn more about the training and get your free report. Justin, I would love for you to walk us through what does 
the the prep look like you know from someone applies to come they decide they're coming down um what does the mm-hmm. prep look like what does the actual retreat itself look like and then what's the sure. integration afterward and the follow-up look like okay so um everybody that wants to come on one of these retreats needs to, needs to fill out a very very detailed application form that covers both their mental health and their physical health as well um, on average, we decline around about 30% of all applications. The key reasons for denying an application are either they have um, a personal history or first or second degree family history with bipolar 1 or 2 disorder um, or schizophrenia. Um, another reason would be generally we don't accept people with a borderline personality uh, disorder diagnosis or strong traits thereof. They are not really su- suitable for group work down here. Um, and as part of the application process, um, which takes a little while, um, the guest is going to have um, a face-to-face Zoom interview with one of our therapists as well. And there we're really just looking to sort of um, have a casual conversation with them, prepare them for the retreat, and also just make sure that they are currently mature enough and stable enough uh, to better work with these medicines. And so our decline rate is around about 30%. So once you've been accepted, you can come on retreat. Um, there's a lot of material that we send them um, for preparation before they get here. Um, and as, a, as aside from that, about two weeks before they arrive, we're going to send them a variety of different mental health rating scales and an adverse childhood event questionnaire. So the rating scales of depression, uh, the different forms of anxiety, um, alcohol use disorder, uh, and so on. So we really, when we combine their application form along with the rating Uh, scales which are self-reported, we have a fairly good understanding of their baseline mental health state before they arrive. Um, The retreat when they arrive is um, seven days long. We do three doses throughout the week and we are known for using high doses. There is no one size fits all when it comes to psilocybin and so I've seen big hockey players weighing in at 250 um, take three dry grams and lay down and have a very powerful inward experience for six hours um, and not require much attention. And then I've seen little old ladies in their 70s um, take 10 grams of psilocybin and then they're tapping their their watch after two hours saying, well, nothing's happening to me, dear. So the reason for the three-dose protocol is that most of our guests are psychedelically naive. Um, That first low dose gives them their first experience. They go into into the shallow end of the pool and it allows us to assess their sensitivity and tolerance. And some will come away from that first dose very underwhelmed um, because not much took place at all, whilst others can have powerful catharsis and a full mystical experience. Um, The second doses and the third doses we increase substantially, but we tailor those towards um, the needs of the clients and how they're responding. I mean, a case in point is that if you're treating, say, a 70-year-old that's had three to four decades of treatment-resistant depression, they're likely going to need much higher doses of psilocybin than maybe somebody in their late 20s or early 30s with treatment-resistant depression. We just see that across the board. And for context, we've served over 2,000 guests, more than 6,000 doses of psilocybin. And so we keep clinical notes throughout the week. um, And we have our longitudinal surveys as well. So once a guest leaves this retreat, um, we're going to send them the same Um, mental health rating scales at months one, three, six, nine, and 12. We've just released our longitudinal outcomes for PTSD, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, and also for major depressive disorder. And what we're looking at are reductions in symptoms of up to 60% 12 months following retreat. So we know that our protocols are effective in how we do this work. We know that our dosing is effective with the high doses. Um, and so the guest is going to experience a, a, a three-dose week over seven days. Each dose is followed the next day by group integration therapy that's led by one of our lead therapists. So typically, the guests are going to get about 30 to 40 hours of group therapy throughout the week. And there's lots of opportunity for one-on-one work one-on-one work with our, with our clients as well. So that, I guess, summarizes the, uh, the mm-hmm. retreat for the week. Um, We run about 40 to 45 retreats every year. We have a psychiatrist on team. We have MDs on call. But the typical retreat team consists of a retreat leader that's either a licensed psychologist or licensed therapist. They are backed up by the lead therapist for that retreat. 
and then the rest of the team members are either senior facilitators or facilitators, many of which in their own right are licensed therapists or licensed clinical social workers. Um, but typically, if you want to progress up to a lead therapist or retreat leader, you need many dozens of retreats under your belt and many thousands of hours of experience uh, before we will put you into that level of responsibility. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it sounds so robust. Um, who, like, tell me a little bit about outcomes. Now, I know that um, like mm-hmm. this kind of work, you can't be like, let me just tie it up in a bow and, you know, say, here's what happens to people. But, you know, like, what are some of the things that, you know, over the time that you've been doing this kind of work that you've seen as positive outcomes from, from these experiences? I would say they are all positive outcomes. The question is only how positive. And I'm very aware that in the self-development world that the word transformation gets thrown around a lot, right? Lots of books have been written about about that. Um, But what we really see here week in, week out is transformation. Um, A lot of our Jamaican staff that work at our locations, whether in the kitchens or they're doing laundry or they're working in the grounds, have witnessed our guests for years. And they say that when they show up down here for the first time, They look like the walking dead. And when they leave here, they're alive again. So whether that's somebody coming in with treatment-resistant depression, they're not making eye contact, they're not connecting with you, they're not attuning with you, they're looking down at the floor, um, you're getting monosyllabic answers. By the end of the week, that person will be making eye contact, will be well-connected with themselves and the other guests as well. They'll be shoulders back, chest out, and ready to take on life again. Um, It's not uncommon to see, I mean, I had a a gentleman down here with uh, chronic PTSD, um, and just to give you, I mean, I won't tell you what his history is, but um, he does have a therapy dog, and he's had therapy dogs for for quite some years. Um, He was used to waking up with horrific nightmares, so neither him nor his dog would get a good night's sleep. Um, He had very severe PTSD. Upon returning home, Um, and he's a doctor, he was minus all of his PTSD symptoms. And that meant now that he's getting a full night's sleep, and so is his dog, I'm happy to respond. But also he had a concealed carry permit, so he would never leave his home prior to retreat without his pistol. Now he doesn't even think about carrying his pistol with him when he leaves the home. And so we deal, you know, this is is how substantial the life changes are. But with that said, it's not just, I mean, we are a mental health model. We're Western contemporary therapeutic model. Uh, We're science, evidence, and research-based. But at the end of the day, um, we see a lot of people coming through here with all manner of childhood sexual abuse. Um, A lot of these individuals have um, maladaptive uh, ways of thinking, leading to maladaptive behaviors. And it's not typical, it's uh, it's not untypical, for example, for maybe a 50-year-old female to, to, to come down here, um, high-functioning, successful in her career, um, and she's got depression, maybe she's cycling through poor romantic relationships, and maybe in the evening just drinks too much wine. Um, it's not uncommon that by the second dose, she will start to recover some of these memories of abuse. Um, and so she, you know, we, will, we will take them through that process, through that catharsis, and typically, once they've processed what their body is held on to, and by what I mean held on to is all the physiological and emotional responses to that trauma, the sense of powerlessness, the sense of disgust, the sense of contamination and shame and fear, once all of that repressed emotion is out and they are able to integrate what happened to them because now it's gone from being if you like, in the unconscious mind, and now it's in the light of their conscious awareness, yes, there is some cognitive dissonance, like how the hell did I not know that this happened to me? Uh, And we're very careful about how we address that trauma. You tend to see that all the maladaptive thinking patterns clear up, the maladaptive behaviors when they go home clear up, the depression goes away, um, they stop drinking alcohol excessively, and now they're able to have much healthier relationships, be it romantic or otherwise. And it's just week in, week out, we see this. People present down here with fibromyalgia, 10 years laying in bed, depressed, anxious, low energy, and in pain. And by the time they leave here, no more pain, no more depression, no more anxiety. Um, we see a lot of people with depression that also have a lot of 
um, polyrheumatoid arthritic conditions, maybe they're professional music, uh, musicians or surgeons or veterinarians, their hands are getting very arthritic, they're thinking about retiring early, and of course psilocybin has great anti-inflammatory properties, and so not only does their depression clear up, um, but their polyrheumatoid arthritic conditions begin to clear up as well, and now they're no longer thinking about retiring early, they can go back and perform surgery. So we just get to see this week in, week out. Mm. So amazing. Justin, uh, my final question is, if every private practitioner in the world were listening right now, what would you want them to know? I would want them to know that there's probably a lot that they need to unlearn um, as to how they've been traditionally uh, educated. Also, as we know from the typical doctor-therapist-psychologist relationship, um, there is a bit of a power differential there where the, where the therapist is up here and the, the client is here. To go for a mutually equitable relationship, an authentic relationship is key. In this kind of work, we don't have weeks and months to build a therapeutic relationship of trust and, and confidence and to build that psychological rapport. We have seven days to build that rapport and it begins the day the guests first arrive. And um, part of that rapport is the fact that we all work with psychedelics. It's not recreational. Um, it's not mandatory that our staff work with psychedelics, but we kind of strongly suggest that they do. And most of them do. Everybody needs to shine the flashlight into their basement, into all the dark corners and work on the material that's in there. And ultimately, as we talk about integration, integration isn't just about the integration of um, the material that came up during the retreat. It's about learning to lead a more integrated life. So there should be as little light as possible shining between how you seem to be to others, how you present to the world, and how you actually are. So being authentic in your relationship with your clients allows them to feel much more psychological rapport and to be able to surrender and relax easy into the process. So awesome. Justin, if people want to connect with you, if they want to read about your retreat center, where should we send them? Um, please go to mycomeditations.com. Um, we have a stable of about 30 to 35 therapists, many of which um, live with us here in Jamaica, but others rotate in and out for five or six weeks at a time. Uh, so we're always looking for new hires. And if you're interested in coming and doing some training and having a longer term relationship with psychedelics, uh, please contact me with justin at micromeditations.com. Mm, so awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the Practice of the Practice podcast. Thank you, Joe. Pleasure to be here. You know, I always love to hear from, from you where you're inspired, what you're thinking, what your clients are saying. Uh, you can always drop me an email, joe at practiceofthepractice.com. I uh, would love to hear about what is this series done for you? What are you thinking? How are you thinking differently? Like, what are you exploring uh, as a result of this? What are you hearing from your clients? If you're like me, you like to gather a lot of information before you make a new decision, like adding a new modality to your practice. That's why I'm so excited that our sponsor for this series, the Psychiatry Institute, has put together an amazing e-report called The Current State of Psychedelic Therapy. You can get that totally for free over at psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply. That's where you can get that free report, The Current State of Psychedelic Therapy, Again, over at psychiatryinstitute.com forward slash apply. Thank you so much for letting me into your ears and into your brain. Have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Special thanks to the band Silence is Sexy for that intro music. And this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, the producers, the publishers, or guests are rendering legal, accounting, clinical, or other professional information if you want a professional you should find one.